fan, Philadelphia 76ers, Eagles, Phillies, Flyers, everything. Um, congrats, a belated congratulations on um, winning the election. I guess you were sworn in a couple a couple months ago. So, so how how much time now does a uh, does a governor have to dedicate to watching sports? Can you actually can you watch sports the way you used to? Or are you doing yeah. more important things? How does that all work? No, I mean I'm I'm a little over a hundred days into the new gig, which. By the way, is I mean, just the highest honor of my life. I'm so proud to serve as as governor, um, but I have not uh, missed a beat when it comes to sports. Now I don't get to kind of watch the way I used to, where I could know that I was dedicating, you know, the two hours or whatever to a game, sitting on the couch with the kids. Yeah. Um, so a lot of it is, you know, on the iPad in the in the truck, traveling across PA or what have you. But I'm still following it crazy close, and um, especially come playoff time, I'm. I'm locked in. I'm as locked in as one of the Sixers are who are playing. Uh, and I got a lot of opinions on it. So. I, I always love that. That's my favorite thing that people say about politicians where it's like, well, doesn't he have more important things to be doing right now? Shouldn't shouldn't he be uh, locked in the Capitol working on like- I can multitask. Uh, I can multitask. Yeah. Yeah, you can do you can do fracking legislation and uh, watch the Sixers on the pad. I'm sure probably, <laughs> probably figure it out at the same time, you know? I figure um, it out. Yeah. So when you when you were on the uh, you're a Monco guy and you grew up a Philly yeah. sports fan, but when you were on the campaign trail, did you did you have to pander to the Pittsburgh people at all? Did you have to wave the terrible towel or tell them that you're a Steelers fan or do any of that? No, let me let me be very clear, Kevin. You cannot bullshit your way through sports. I mean, <laughs> you just can't. And and I'll tell you, uh, if I'm in if I was doing a podcast in Pittsburgh, um, and someone said Eagles or Steelers, I'd say Eagles, and they could boo me or whatever. Mm -hmm. But this is my approach. I'm I'm an avid sports fan. So if the Steelers are playing not against the Eagles, I want to watch that game. I'm going to cheer on the Steelers. I'm pumped up for them. And in fact, my lieutenant governor is from Pittsburgh. His wife works for the Steelers. She's one of the executives there. So I have no problem kind of cheering on the, the Pittsburgh teams. I want to see them be successful. I want to see them do well. For example, I'm thrilled the Pirates are doing so well. Yeah. But when they play against the Phils, I'm going to root for the yeah. Phil. So that is how I approach this. Um, I love sports, uh, but you don't bullshit your way through sports. That is the type of honesty I think that actually helped uh, Fetterman do well in this region because we did like a bit on the website where we'd always give him shit about being a Sheets guy, you know, and be like, right. well, are you ready to capitulate to uh, to Wawa or whatever, right? And he would say the same thing that you would say. He'd say, well, I don't, I don't know what you want me to say. I'm a Sheets guy, you know. And I, that actually play, that played well in Delco. Because yeah. they were like, oh, this guy's real. He's honest. He's not pandering to us. So knowing that the Pittsburgh fans are, are similar to us, I'm sure they appreciated that. Yeah, you you just you you cannot BS your way through sports. And you know, look, our daughter goes to Pitt. So I'm I'm also a huge Pitt Panthers fan. That's mm. a genuine, you know, uh, fondness I have for them. But you just gotta you gotta be true. And um for me, just to Oh, you're a West Virginia guy. Yeah, sorry about that. All right. Well, anyway, it was great being on with you, and uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll see you next time. But anyway, it's um, you just you just got to be true, and and I think people people really appreciate that. I will say the culture is really different. I mean, for example, the Steelers have an unbelievable winning culture. I mean, six mm -hmm. rings, right? God yeah. willing, the Eagles get to that. And I've been to a number of tailgates. Um, at the Steelers, and by the way, I won't wear a Steelers jersey when I go there, but I'll yeah. I'll root for them. Folks are so friendly, so kind, so warm and welcoming. And then I was doing a tailgate at the Eagles game shortly before the election. And Austin Davis, our lieutenant governor, goes, uh, <laughs> mind if I wear my Steelers jersey? I was like, look, man, you can wear your Steelers jersey, but I won't have your back. Like, if if you get into it with the fans there, you're on your own. And yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. He, he made it out alive. He was all right. I actually, so this is a question I had written down for later in the thing, but I'll, I'll jump to it now because I've got family out in Greensburg and they're all Steelers mm -hmm. and, and Pirates yeah. and, and Penguins fans. I honestly have to say, and you're a basketball guy, so you can speak to this, but I, yeah. I think Pittsburgh would be a great NBA city um, just because I know it's not like traditionally a basketball town, but the fans are great. They're very much like us. They're very similar to, yeah. to Philly sports fans, yeah. just diehards. And like, you know, Pitt, Pitt had a really, really good basketball program not long ago. Duquesne was all right. I mean, there's there's knowledgeable fans there. I don't I don't think it's like really uh, that far fetched to see the NBA do. I'm not saying the NBA will ever will ever go there, but I could see them doing well if they had an NBA team there. I, I think they do great. And I'll tell you what we're we're sort of trying to work on is a WNBA team in Pittsburgh. Yeah. There's there's a couple groups that are focused on that, and I think that would be pretty extraordinary if we can pull that off.
Um, so let me back it up here. You are a four for four Philadelphia sports fan, but but the Sixers in basketball has always been your number one thing. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. What's so what's the background there? How did that come to be? First off, I just love hoops. I played a lot as a kid. Um, I still play. Uh, you know, coach my younger kids and really enjoy. Um, I just love the sport. I love the team aspect of it. I've just always loved it, and um, and and through that obviously fell in love with the Sixers. And you have to understand, so I'm 49. Mm -hmm. The the 1980 team, right? Uh, 1980, 1983, right? That as the Phillies and the Sixers were were doing so well there. Those were my formative years, right? That's when I became a fan. And then I had to live through like the next 25 years where they, uh, <laughs> you know, none of the teams won. But, yeah, um, yeah. you know, growing up on uh, what I think was still the best backcourt ever, in Philly sports, Cheeks and Tony. I mean, yep. I thought they were no offense to Harden and Maxi, who are you know obviously playing lights out right now, but mm -hmm. Cheeks and Tony, I don't know that anybody had a quicker first step than Andrew Tony. And I don't know that anyone was ever a better floor general than Mo Cheeks. And so having them, you know, Moses, and then of course Dr. J, who was really like the first star that played above the rim. Obviously, yeah. MJ yeah. came along after that and perfected it. And you know, he's, he's obviously the goat, but that those were the years where I fell in love with not just basketball, but Sixers basketball. And, you know, I, I like to think it's maybe the one good thing I've done for my kids. I've passed that down to them and, <laughs> um, and, and, you know, we just love it. I mean, our, game one, for example, we were all together on the couch, which was really special. Our daughter yeah. was in college and we were screaming. I mean, it was like the most intense experience obviously yeah. it turned out great but you know i've just always been a diehard fan and, and, and love the team um so obviously you, you know for for people who are watching this we this is going live on thursday but we taped this so we didn't want we didn't want to get caught up in a game two timeline kind of thing but yeah. we can talk very generically about the series and i guess i would ask you number one what just what you thought about game one but but yeah. in a in a very basic sense like if the if the sixers are going to win the series what 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 has to happen in your mind yeah, so let's talk about game one and then let's talk about going forward. Yes. So yeah. We have a healthy Joel. I, I was, um, even though we were kind of only down, I think it was five, six points at halftime of game one, I was really worried about the second half because I thought, frankly, B ball Paul was playing small. Um, I thought that Brown and Tatum um, were able to get through Maxie and Harden on the perimeter. And then there was just like nothing in the lane to stop them. It was like Swiss cheese in there. Yeah. And whatever happened at halftime, I, I I guess I read one of the accounts, you know better than I, they kind of got on B-Ball Paul. He started playing bigger and tougher. I thought the defense really firmed up. Um, we hit our shots. I remember Boston was shooting lights out, like 70%, yeah. I think, in the first half. Yeah. You knew they couldn't continue that. And I just love the grit that the team showed. Yeah, Harden was on fire this half, but these guys hit big shots, including Tobias Harris. You know, when Harden – Toward the end, drove down the lane, flipped the ball back over his shoulder. You know, Tobias, who doesn't always finish, um, you know, when he needs to, he finished. And they did what they had to do. They played good team defense. And I thought that gave him a lot of, a lot of confidence to now have, you know, again, knock on wood, a healthy Joel for the long run. I think going forward, Joel showed in the first series – how he could score less, but pass out of that double team mm -hmm. and create open shots, you know, for Melton and Maxie and Harden. And these guys knock down their shots and Tobias as well. And so I think, you know, if Joel's able to do that and then also be that big presence in the lane and know that he can get maybe a longer spell that he's going to need with a, mm -hmm. a banged up knee and B-Ball Paul's got some more confidence because the fact that he played game four in – round one and played so strong in, in uh, game one of the second series. Um, I think that we're well positioned. I mean, I have been worried in our second rounds in the last number of years. I feel more yeah. optimistic right now that the Sixers can get through the Celtics. Um, my take on the MVP was that uh, certainly Joel Embiid deserved it. I thought he deserved it last year. I thought he deserved it the year before. I think Nikola Jokic and, and Giannis probably deserved it all of the, all three of those years too. And I think when we look back at this era 15, 20 years from now, you know, if you tell me that each one of those guys had won at least one MVP, um, I, I certainly would have thought that was fair. Um, I don't know yeah. if the voters think that way or vote that way, but now when, when we look back on it now, Embiid finally winning the MVP, your thoughts on that? Well, first off, I'm I'm so happy for him personally. This guy has sacrificed physically, uh, mentally, 
to put himself in a position, and I think you really saw this maybe two seasons ago, to be in shape, uh, to be healthy other than a few of these kind of freak injuries, and, and to become the leader that this team needed. And now to have a supporting cast around him that um, that that I think understands how to play effectively with him, I'm just so I'm so happy for him. I'm proud of him, and I'm excited for the city. And by the way, he was going up against some great competition. I mean, Jokic is yeah. one of the greatest players ever. Mm -hmm. He's an extraordinary mm -hmm. basketball player. His court vision is. I mean, it's just it's just amazing. Yeah, second to none. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like amazing. So I, I'm so happy for him, but I, I also know he won't feel satisfied unless they win it all. And and it seems yeah. like that's what he's locked in and focused on. I thought it was really cool in game one against Boston. The camera kept, I was watching on TV. I don't know, maybe you were there, but mm -hmm. when the camera would point to him, he was genuinely excited for his yeah. team. He's genuinely yeah. pumped up for them. That's the sign of a leader. He was like coaching the guys on the sideline. He didn't even need to be on the sidelines, but he was there. And I think that's a sign of a great leader. So I think physically, he was just 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 a demanding presence, a dominating presence yeah, um, yeah. this year. And mentally and emotionally, he was a great leader. Yeah, there was buy-in. There was maturation from him. You know, early in his career with his quotes and the way he would present himself to the media and on the court, to be kind of riding the roller coaster up and down, you know, a little emotional, right. a little open, a little closed off. And he's, he's a more consistent entity, I think, at this point. But I, I do think... Yeah, I think people get caught so caught up so much in the in the Jokic and Bead, Jokic and Bead bullshit that you kind of forget like what every everything that Joel has been through. Yeah, uh, didn't start playing basketball until he was fifteen. Only played a year at Kansas. Came in, had the navicular, had the facial fracture, had the had the meniscus, right. had every every other injury. Your I can't remember. Finger, yeah, when he got the finger caught in the jersey or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and I lost a brother. I mean, when you put all of that, when you put that stuff. When you put the Jokic and Embiid like argument off to the side, and you just look at a vacuum of what Joel overcame to get to this point. I mean, it's a fantastic story. Everybody in the media, the sports media, loves stories, right? They love telling stories, right? It's about when uh, you know Johnny Four Fingers threw that fastball at Connie Mack Stadium f fifty years ago. I mean, right. I guess this is one of those stories, though, isn't it? Yeah, it, it totally is. And um, he's just—I mean, he's an extraordinary guy who's who's dealt with a lot of challenges, as you said. He's done the hard work. Um, and now, you know, he's affecting the next generation of basketball fan. I talked to you about my journey to become a Sixers fan. You know, now looking at my kids, 12, 14, 18, and, and 21, those particularly the younger ones, I mean, they're growing up with Joel. They're seeing this. They're, yeah. they're seeing kind of how we're on the precipice of like that, you know, getting to that next level. And it reminds me a little bit of what it must have been like to be, you know, a Pistons fan, then a Bulls fan. When they remember those years when they kind of had to beat the best to get there. Yeah, I think yeah. watching Joel get his, you know, get himself together, get his leadership together, get his physical, you know, body together, and now being in a place where they're knocking on the door of getting through what has been this ceiling for them, the yeah. second round. I think they get through this. And the sky's the limit for him and, and this team and, and the next generation of Philly sports fans. Well, and I hope people just appreciated the ride, regardless of what happens in the playoffs, because there was a lot of people who had this philosophy. We talked about it on this show multiple times of keeping the team at an arm's length because they didn't want to buy in emotionally again and get burned in the playoffs. You know, because they'd watch the second round exits and they said, well, how much am I going to invest in this when I've been when I've been hurt in the past? But I hope that people were at least watching and beat and enjoying and beat and being being able to to take that into account not always thinking like well you know it doesn't mean anything unless they get past the second round i you know if, if if we're saying that then there's a lot of seasons that don't mean anything so i guess that was my argument to people was just saying like yeah. I, you know, you have you, look. I know that the championship is what matters most. I know that getting that past the second round is what matters most. But don't sleep on MVP because there's only five Sixers who have, who have ever won it. You know, so right. I, I don't sleep on it and get emotionally invested. I mean, where's the yeah. point? Where should be emotionally. Uh, that is the point. That is the point. Yeah. yeah. Um, last one for you, Governor. Um, I got, I got to get your thoughts on on the Sixers' proposal to to uh, to build that arena in Center City. Obviously, they're not even they're be nine years away if the thing gets approved and if it goes through um it's been highly politicized there's opposition there's support i mean it's kind of taken on a life of its own but just for, from yeah. from your perspective I'm, I'm curious what you make of it yeah i mean I, first off i think we just need to like look at this calmly and rationally and take some of the heat out of it and i'll just say as a governor um as a huge sixers fan i mean i want to make sure the sixers are here for a good long while and that they have a great facility to to play in 
Um, I think it's you know a great thing that the owners have proposed doing this without any public money. They're not asking me as governor. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware that they're asking anyone for any kind of public money. And I actually think what the city did, maybe it was a couple of weeks ago or something, Kev, they, they said, um, we're going to just carefully study this. Let's make yeah. sure that we're kind of taking some of the noise out of the conversation and looking at this thing in like a really thoughtful and concrete way. And I think that's the best thing we can do right now is just sort of study this issue carefully and make sure we're making the best possible decision um, for the future of the city, the future of the neighborhoods, the future of this great team, um, and the future needs of our Commonwealth. Yeah, it's not too much to ask. Let's try. Well, maybe it is too much to ask to just look at something ca calmly and, and rationally these yeah. days. But to kind of withdraw the the vitriol from it and just say, well, look, let's, be, let's be honest. Like Philadelphia is not the first is not the first city you think of when it comes to welcoming change. You know, so maybe try to like get people to think of. All right, well, we've been going to the sports complex for forever, but let's just th at least think about what. I'm a big, yeah, I'm a big believer in like thoughtful you know, calm, rational review of things and and frankly, trying to bring people together. I mean, yeah. you're in this building, I'm in the Capitol now, it's about bringing Democrats and Republicans together. Yeah. Yeah. For this, it's about bringing different, you know, components of the city uh, together. And there's a, there's a lot of differing interests here. But the only thing I'm not calm about is rooting for the Sixers and being a sport. <laughs> that, I get very emotional. Well, you come back on the show sometime in the fall, and we'll try to apply some of that rational talk to Eagles fans when they install the new defensive coordinator. I'm sure we'll have plenty of complaining on that. So we'll try to we'll try I'm to bullish. go even code. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what, I'm bullish on the birds. How he did another amazing job. That guy deserves a lot of credit. Um, they got a great coaching staff, great owners. You know, Jeffrey Lurie cares so deeply about the city and the team. I think they're in a really, really strong position. Don't sleep on the fills. I know they they got off to a little bit of a slow start, but they're winning a ton of games right now. They're hot. They're hitting. Bryce is back. I mean, I really, I really think we're in this sort of other than the Flyers. I mean, we're in like this really unique moment. And I keep telling my kids, I'm like, it wasn't always this way, right? Um, I kind of want them to suffer through some lean years, but you know, they're they're seeing Eagles win the Super Bowl and Phillies go to the World Series and Sixers playing well. So. You know, my kids are a little spoiled, but, you know, those of us who have lived through this, um, you know, it is uh, it's wonderful to see, you know, us being in, in the good years now. Well, we will keep riding the wave and hopefully that continues into the Eagles season and beyond. Governor Josh Shapiro, thanks for your time. We'll have to get you back on. Awesome. I'd love to and keep up the great work. Love your podcast. And um, thanks for having me on.